If you would turn to the book of Acts, chapter 17, I will meet you there. Acts chapter 17. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand really high. And somebody will grab you one and bring it down. Everybody got one? Okay, why don't you guys start with us? Good, good, good. Okay. Acts chapter 17, go ahead and meet you there. I want to read to you some words from Jesus recorded in Matthew chapter 6. Listen to these words as I read them to you and let them form the, the foundation, the framework for what we're going to look at in the book of Acts this morning. It's comes from Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye of the lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be the great. Great and dark, dark and light. This is a common theme throughout Scripture. I want to bring you in a little of my story, but I need to give you a spoiler alert. If you are still in the last vestiges of the delusion that you have to pass through, this story, this story will ruin that for you. So, I apologize. Just lay it down. Just lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Um, so, uh, growing up, uh, I would say that I was in a very loving family. I was very blessed. And so, I, I was not allowed to have a motorcycle. Pretty sure I got a motorcycle within the hour. I took up residency in, the, in my first college, the state of my first college, Wyoming. I didn't allow to stay out after dark very, very often. I was not even to stay up late. One of the things as a kid that really just crushed me under the tyranny of parents was that professional wrestling on Saturday nights went from 10 o'clock to midnight. But they didn't bring out the big names until after 11. My bedtime was a I never thought to stay up for the things. Oh, it's just how, it just amazes me how mean parents can be when they're trying to love you and raise you up and at least get you to the team before you, you know, run off a cliff somewhere. So I'm just doing those things. Why? I leave home, get out from underneath the tyranny of that, and I'm to be my own man. And I leave home and go to my first college. And I did. I looked for myself. I did everything that I wanted to do. Hey, me, 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 me. Most of it didn't work. I guess none of it worked. But anyway, I won't go into the details of that, but it was about time in my life. And still to this day, I don't have an explanation for this. My brother came in and visited, and I loaded everything I had up in a 65 Pontiac Catalina Ventura four door Johnny Hartow. And me, and my motorcycle in the back seat, and my brother, and two dogs and everything I owned made our way down, and, and I moved to the town that my parents had moved to while I was in college. To this day, they don't know why I did that. But I was living for the Lord. I was running from the Lord. I was living for myself. But now I'm, I go back and I'm living in mommy and daddy's house. Big tough on my own kind of guy. Trying to get my feet on the ground, trying to get a job, trying to get my own place. My brother was very helpful and encouraged me that I was not part of that family anymore. I was living in the guest room. Uh, but nonetheless, I was there, and uh, it was like on eight acres, and there was like a, I don't have a boat, so don't think of it like that. But at one point, the people that owned that big thing, there was like a boat house or a garage out in the back, and that's kind of where they wanted me to park my motorcycle, because by then I had a motorcycle. So see this picture, right? You know, broke loose of all the tyranny of loving parents. Most of them are living for myself. I got me a motorcycle. It was not a motorcycle, but it was a motorcycle. And I'm out till all night, all times of the night, and I can do whatever I want because I'm a man. So I pull in that driveway late, late at night. Everybody's already asleep. I'm on the other side of the road, and I'm strutting across the yard in the dark to get in the back side of the last door. I want to tell you something about the dark. I hate the dark. It's amazing in that short trip from out of the boathouse where I had to park to the side of the last door. I 
so many evil and horrible monsters are out there. I remember the trampling and shifting the light became this black hole. I shine a flicker on a leaf. Every minute was so attuned in those moments to everything out there. And if my strut turned into a dead run, and this 19 year old kid who knew everything and on my own, I ran to the glass back glass and I made it. I made it. I'm like, you're an idiot, but I made it. Open the door, go in, but I got my strut back on pretty quick. I'm like, yeah, I can't stay out of I was scared, but I can stay out of the way. That thing's so scary. Not that much. And I thought, you know what? I ain't going to bed neither. They ain't going to tell me when to go to bed. I'm a man now. So I got everything, got my little snack out, I got everything up, turned the TV on in the living room, and most the height of my rebellion, I sat in my father's chair. I don't know if you want to take that sleeping there. And I am set up in my little kingdom that I've created for myself as a man, and I turned that TV on. Now, let me tell you something about Texas. I don't believe in evolution. But if you're going to take Texas, in Texas, because the cockroaches there no longer are satisfied with scurrying out of the manhole covers, they have learned how to fly. I ain't lying to you. The cockroaches know how to fly. So here I am, I'm set up in my kingdom, I'm sitting in my dad's chair, I'm my own man, I'm watching TV until I can watch all the professional wrestling I want to watch. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, comes this velociraptor with these skills in the form of a flying cockroach, and it comes straight at me. It scared me so bad, I flipped over the back of my dad's chair. I'm looking for cover. I stand up. I can't find him. I'm looking around. He's nowhere to be found. Ninja, I'm telling you. And so I push my, the back of my chair, my dad's chair up, closed up the legs, put my stuff in the kitchen, and scurried off to bed to hide under the covers. <laughs> I'm still afraid of that. I don't even like to look. There's a 1200 lumen flashlight with me everywhere I go. I put extra batteries in the truck. I'm not going to be in the dark anymore. Last week, we talked about trusting God in the dark. In the context of that, we're talking about trusting God when God seems very far away. When He's not right in front of your eyes saying, Can you do this? Go this way. Trust me and obey in this direction. But when He seems like He's distant, when we seems like we can't hear Him, and we, we, we communicate that as trusting God in the dark. But what I want you to hear this morning is that trusting God in the dark is not the same thing as walking blindly through this world. Listen to me. Trusting God in the dark is not the same thing as walking blindly through this world. So the question is, how can we navigate that we're trusting God in the dark, meaning God is trusting us to grow up and mature, and we're stepping out in faith, and we're walking into this darkness. Now, the reality is, the darkness we walk in is typically not from the boathouse to the sliding, the sliding glass door. Uh, typically, it's not on a trail in the middle of the night. Those things happen occasionally. But what the darkness we're talking about, the best way, I think, to describe it and understand it is, the, uh, is culture. Think about that, what, what we mean by culture. Culture is a unique thing in our world because culture, you can make an argument that culture is constantly shaping each of us. Can't you? I mean, look at what's acceptable today in our culture versus what was acceptable 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We can see that culture has a shaping effect on us, but culture is what we shape. There's a unique aspect of culture. We do culture as we think our thoughts, as we say our words, as we move out in a direction or choose not to move out in a direction. It's, it's, it's that thing that that concrete, put it on the brick and we lay it down. And we take another one and we lay it down. And we're building this culture with every move we make in, in life. But then also, as those bricks are laid and those buildings are built, we begin to see that they form us. Because now, I used to be walk straight this way, but now there's a building there, so I have to walk around. Culture is a unique thing that we shape, but it shapes us. And culture, culture can be scary. 
culture can be as frightening as a ninja cockroach or a walk from a boathouse to a sliding glass door in the middle of the night. We see things in our culture that scares us. Because I know you know what I'm talking about. I mean, we have social media now. I, think, I mean, how many times do we go on social media and see something that's happened or something that's been said or some argument that's going on and we get mixed and we get scared and we get, well, we get fired up. It's a little fear. We get fired up. We get stirred up. Whether it's through fear, whether it's through anger, or whether it's through joy, excitement, the things in our culture, we see them and they fire us up. And my question for us this morning as we gather around, like we talked about last week, as we gather around that, that, that fire pit of the discussion this morning, the question that I have for you is, as you look at you, and you look at you existing in the culture that we live, what fires you up? And I thought that we were both about the Seahawks game last weekend. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I thought I was going to have a physical heart attack. I took an aspirin. I got so nervous during that game. I got fired up. We were a stupid Seahawks game. I just said, the friend is not here. I'll the stupid part. It fires you up. I see it. I see it. I hear it in your conversations over at the coffee shop. I see it on social media. We hear it on the news. What fires you up? The next question may be more important. What are you going to do about it? When the culture that we're building, all of a sudden it feels like it's coming at us and building us. And the fires us up inside. What are you going to do about it? Well, we get to walk with Paul as he walks into perhaps the biggest culture shock of his life in the city of Athens. And that's chapter 17. Chapter 17. So go ahead with me. Acts 17. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up and start in verse 10 to get a running start at this. So join me to Acts chapter 17, verse 10. Now the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more notable than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. They got fired up, didn't they? They saw Paul changing their culture. They got fired up, and what did they do? They came and agitated. They came and stirred things up against him. So in verse 14, the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they would come. While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, we'll stop right there for a second. I want you to see the picture here. Paul is making his second missionary journey. He, they're traveling through here. Picked up Timothy, Silas, Timothy, Paul. They're the dynamic team there, and they come now. Uh, people have been raised against them. They got to get Paul out of town quick. They put him on a ship. He sails all the way down without his compadres, and then he comes into Athens, and he's waiting for them to come back. So in our time, what we would liken this to would be a layover. The, the, the big thing I remember is I left here one winter and it was a uh, storm that kept planes down. I was supposed to go to UAE. The plane left out of Chicago. We were on the phone debating whether I should even get on the plane in Portland. Finally, do get started. I land at the wrong end of Chicago Air Airport. And if you've ever been there, it is a big airport. I was at the wrong end at the exact minute that the plane is supposed to take off on the other end. I called my buddy, and I said, what am I supposed to do? And he said, fat boy, listen. And so I took my, I took my duffel bag, my big cabela's duffel bag, I threw it on my back, like it was a, and I ran. You know, I can't even, there's probably people today telling me stories. I don't know, I was just sitting down over the turf, never was, but there was this big fat guy running through with a backpack. I ran, I hurdled seats, I was out of breath, I mean, I did everything. I, 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 went, I ran past them, then I go, 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 I run down that long chute, and I get there, and as I, and I can finally see inside the airplane, there's my buddy, and he's got the students going, well, what's this? And, and what's this over here? And then he looks at me and he goes, thank you, and goes and sits down. Held up the entire transportation industry 
from men to women. That was, a, that was a hectic layover. Paul is on a layover. He's waiting in Athens. He's just like there. He's looking at his clock. He's waiting for the ship to go back and get Timothy and to get Silas and bring his team back together. And then he can go off and continue this missionary journey. And look what happens. We pick up in verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked with people. As he saw that the city was full of idols, Paul was fired. He was stirred up to them. As he saw that the city was full of idols, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? It's like a picture of a little baby picking up seeds and dropping them in places. Like, who is this? I didn't even know what he's talking about. He's just dropping these little seeds of truth everywhere. He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. My point on here. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. So may we know what the new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, are the Athenians and the foreigners who live there who spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new? They don't really accomplish anything anymore. Now, here's the crazy thing. This is a culture shock that Paul would walk into, landing at probably the biggest place in Athens. I think there were three, but he probably owned the biggest one. He's looking up on the hill, and they are monuments that he has probably never seen before in his life. Remember, his world and the center of his religious experience was the temple that Herod rebuilt. Beautiful in and of itself, but nothing compared to what the Greeks had built. This Athens, at the height of Greek culture, Athens was it. It was the center. It was a flagship. It was ever. This is where thought, sense of thought, was born <laughs> in this place. I mean, people that you would recognize their names uh, were, were there. Like, go back 500 years, and I know Socrates is a name that you would recognize. 500 years, Socrates began, and you would believe that he was the foundation, if not the father himself, of modern Western philosophy. Meaning that we would deal with things other than just how do we get the grain to grow up? How do we get the crops to come in? How do we make it from day to day? But they brought minds together and begin to think of such things that we take for granted today, like ethics, how we relate to each other, logic, how we actually relate to the truth, epistemology, how, how, we, how we gather information, how we learn, and pedagogy, how we teach that information to the next generation. We take all these things for granted in our culture today. But 500 years before Paul came on the scene, this is what the Greeks were dealing with. They were having these conversations. Later, Plato would come in, and he built the Academy, the first Western university. We took universities for granted. How many of you watched the college football game yesterday? Anybody in this room watch a college football game yesterday? I might be able to take this home. We take the culture of university for granted in our culture, but this is what we did in 400 years. Before Paul came up, 300 years before, we'd see Aristotle come in. Aristotle, among all the other things, was actually, history says, the, the personal tutor to Alexander the Great, who would take the world. This was a huge place, a big place. But by Paul's day, and this is important to this context, by Paul's day, it was not what it was at that time. The world and culture had passed it by. It had lost its bite, it had lost its edge. Really, Overshadowed Athens. Rome was the epicenter of building brick after brick the culture of the day. Athens was the great evidence of a culture of the past. For the most part, it was ruins. Even though they built Paul, which at one time would have been modest, everyone around to have these, it wasn't like a trial like, they, like you would see in these other places, but this was a bit more like a, like a huge community conversation where we would come in and, and try to hear the truth and discern the truth. We don't even meet there anymore. They met over to the side, and like the, in the shadow of the ruins, but they just met in a little corner over there. But nonetheless, they were still there. They still kept meeting. They still kept having these conversations. At this point, about nothing. They weren't cutting any edges. They weren't building any buildings. They just kind of reminiscing of what they had built in culture before. 
And when I talk about the bricks of culture, I'm not talking about physical bricks, but they live in the shadow of these physical bricks, a constant reminder of the culture that they had tried to build, a culture that was failing, and they were abiding the ruins of it. And Paul walks into the middle of that. He was a place that was very religious and very spiritual and very lost and very dark. But some of the things, I mean, he would have seen the Acropolis was there, the Agrippa was there, where they came and had these nothing in the mountains, all these different stores where they would have these columns that were covered and they were all different things. Uh, one of my favorites was that I read they had a temple that was too far to pronounce his name, but it was the God of Craftsmen. Here's my theory on that. All these well to do hired all these craftsmen to build all these things for all their gods and the craftsmen over a coffee break. Finally got together and said, you know what, we ought to make our own God. So they made God the craftsmen and said, we're going to build him a temple too. I love it. He even had a, 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 a God to the craftsmen. Two of the Aries was there. The Panathetic Way, so you would, you would walk on his way and see all these statues to the gods. They had even the altar of the twelve gods there. Paul walked into all of this, and his spirit was perfect. I understand that emotion. As I turn on the news, as I look at social media, as I hear even to go that far, even in our little community, there's a place that we've been slowly making some headway and, and having a Christian influence in, in one of the organizations that are here. I just found out this morning on the way to Morton Church that one person complained and they've shut the doors. And Christians aren't allowed to do Christian things in there anymore. I hear that. I see that. And I'm scared with me. I'm fighting that. I also see, and this breaks my heart, but I see this. I cannot turn on social media and not that Kathy's got me on social media and Lori's got me on social media and I've got to be on there. I'm seeing it more and more. But I, it's hard enough to see what the world that doesn't know God is doing, but it doesn't seem like a day where I can get on there and see a would be Christian brother or sister putting something on right there that may be true, but in this presentation it pushes away instead of draws in. One of the ones that keeps circulating is something about God saying the Bible that's true and it doesn't matter about your opinion. Your opinion doesn't matter. And we'll make our stand. But is that in fact? Or does that push away? I, I, I told you that this week. I said, I wish they could have done that. Back. But you know. You know. To God and to His people. But we, we don't do that. That's part of the conversation. That's part of the communication. I think there's a reason for that. It scares us to see the darkness of our culture. It frightens us. It ignites in us both righteousness and pridefulness. I think some of it is fear and shame and embarrassment because I think somewhere deep within we know that these bricks that have been built have either been built by us or because we didn't show up for work that day and somebody else was building them. And we see this culture of darkness pushing back against us and it causes panic in us. And now a trampoline becomes this black hole of an abyss that's going to suck us in. A little bit quicker becomes the eye shine of an enemy. And I'm pretty sure we're a dead woman or we're lashing out in that pain and that fear of uh, anybody that will. And we post stuff on social media and we have these conversations and they push people away. Even with the truth. Rather than to draw them in. But I want us to see how Paul reacted when he was fired up at this decision that not only was taking over and, and taking over all of the world, but he was in the wake of that, looking at the ruins of this culture, and he didn't answer any of the questions. The world has always tried to answer the questions of life without God. And Greek did it, the Greeks did it just like we do it. But Paul was able to stand there and see this civilization begin to come right before his eyes. And so he not only saw the darkness advancing, but he also saw in the wake of that darkness, death and decay, and he didn't even answer the questions they were trying to answer. And all of that fired him up inside. And he didn't get a megaphone. He didn't start speaking hate language. He didn't go on social media and drop the mic and walk off and go, yeah, that's the truth. Look at what Scripture says. says that he 
reason. And who did he reason with? Everybody. He reasoned with everybody. He went to the synagogue. Those who knew that there was one God created the universe. He went there. He went to those that weren't Jews, but they were, they were listening to that message of one God. They were God fearers. He would talk to them. But he would also talk to the Epicureans and the Stoics in the marketplace. Both of these groups believed that there was no other life. So again, when the Bible says that we have three enemies, Satan, the world, and our own flesh, the, the definition of that world is what I said earlier. It's trying to answer the questions of life without including God in the answer. That's what we mean. That's what the Bible means by world. Well, the Epicureans and the Stoics were both trying to answer the questions of life without God in the picture. Both of them had come to the conclusion that there was no afterlife, but both of them came at it in different ways. So the Epicureans, which we would label as hedonists, said, since there's no life after this, then we wouldn't want to. Get all that you can. Live for yourself. If it pleases you in the moment, own it. Love it. Be proud of it. Put it out there for everybody to see. Paul engaged them. Paul went and reasoned with them. The Stoics, on the other hand, they also didn't believe that there was life after death. They were pantheists. They believed that all of life was God. And so after your short little insignificant existence, you would just melt back in, melt back into the God that is in everything. And so they took a different approach. They came out of saying that life should be about self-control and self-sufficiency and self-stability. Does any of this ring a bell with you? Does any of this sound like I'm describing Greek culture in Paul's day or your culture in our day? We live in a culture today that says there is no God, and half of them are going, let's say a third of them are going, we'll just live how you want to live. Whatever pitches you in the moment, I'll be proud of it. But the other third is going, no, we just need to self control and be self sufficient, self, 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 self. The third third is doing both of them in some weird combination. That's the culture we live in. Paul reasoned with anybody and everybody everywhere. And look what this word reason means. We have got to own this today. It's a natural combination word, and it comes from two words, dia and it. Is similar to the word dialogue. Do is to make a way. Love means to relate to one another. Now think about that. Paul said of darkness, advancing into culture, where culture then begins to shape that we're supposed to shape culture. He sees this. He sees the decay of it. He sees the atrocity of it. It probably stirs in him the same emotions it stirs in us. But how did he handle it? He went out into the marketplace. He went into the churches. He went to anybody who would have a conversation with him. And he made a way to relate to them so that he could speak the truth. Trust in God in the back as long as he focused his heart on the right thing, then he could make his way through those dark shadows of culture. How did he do that? He preached Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Jesus Christ and the resurrection. We get so caught up in the culture and in the fear and the last thing that we think that we've got to go for everybody and start everything. They had gods for everybody there. They were, they, they were so afraid that they would miss God that they put an unknown God up there. So it's made a God. We don't know your name, but we're going to worship you so that you don't get ticked off at us and do something bad to us. Guys, it's not even to us. Pretty soon, the phone, this sticker in the Northwest is going to have to certainly navigate the entire view. Can you see an F-350 extended cab with a pink sticker that goes all the way around? But there's, there's all these new gods every day. There's new answers to try to answer the questions of life without including Yahweh, the one true God in that answer. At the end of that little this sticker eventually is going to be this question mark. I don't know. It's an unknown God. Paul's 
stirred up in his spirit could have taken to social media, taken to the streets, taken to the megaphone, and said, I'm going to attack every one of those false religions. But what did he do? He made a way to relate to him. And he says, I know that you're very religious. And yet you even have an altar to an unknown God, a God that you don't know His name. Well, I've got good news for you today. I know you. This is Yahweh. He's the creator of the universe. He created everything and every way that all of us live in. The breath we breathe is His. And He loves you. And because He loves you, He sent His Son to the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. And His Son conquered death and rose again. And we can trust Him as Lord and Savior. He paid the way to relate to us around Him, even in the darkness of, 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 of all of this culture that seems instead of us building, it's now starting to build us. And instead of being angry and ugly and repellent with the truth, He said, how can I cut away in this in this dark shadow, so that other people come see the light. Well, you can't do that if you take your eyes off of God and onto the culture. When I get scared, I know this when I start lashing out and I see that in myself, just that I know. I know that I'm not looking at God. I know I'm not trusting in Jesus and the resurrection. I'm looking at my culture. I'm ashamed that I let it get this far. And I'm scared of where it's going to take us. And you start lashing out or running for the door. When you're in a state of mind, a little ninja cockroach can ruin your life. But as soon as I got some light on, that thing was never to be found. Paul found a way to walk in the dark without walking blindly. To trust God in the dark without walking blindly, he found that way by keeping his eyes on Jesus and the resurrection. And finding a way with his family members, with his neighbors, with his co-workers, with his people in the community, and then the world. How to make a connection of relationship so he could speak the good news of the truth. Guys, I need you to be fired up. But don't let that lead to anger and repent. But let it lead to love and a passion to draw people in. Paul never compromised what he believed, not for a second. Paul didn't go down and take it as culture kept building and boxing him in? No! But the way he fought back was not a megaphone and a sign and an ugly little mini quote. But it was by going out into the marketplace and finding a connection so that he could have a relationship so that he could communicate the good news of truth. One of the things that scares us is that we don't know if we can handle how do we make connections with all these different religions and all these different beliefs. Let me check the hook a little bit there. There's only two religions in the world, and there only has ever been, since Genesis 3, there's only ever been two religions in the whole world. Either God is everything, or humanity is everything. That's it. Don't, don't, don't be confused. You don't think those two straight, right? Either God is the measure of everything, or humanity is the measure of everything. And what we see in these different expressions of religion is just a, a personalization of one of those two things. And so when you go out into this world, it, I, I can see how it would be so easy for Paul to look at all of these gods and the ruins of worship of all these gods and go, oh my goodness gracious, how do I deal with this? How in the world am I going to disprove everything that they believe? You don't have to. And they don't answer the question of the soul. But we have to go around and disprove them. Paul said, I'm going to keep my eyes focused on Jesus and the resurrection, that he is life, that he's truth, that he's the way. If I can focus on that and then work in such a way as to find these inroads, he went to he didn't he didn't he didn't what's the word I'm looking for? He was prejudice. He went everywhere. Right? He went into the churches. He went into the marketplace. He spoke to the to the hedonist. He spoke to the self, 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 self sufficient. He spoke to everybody to find a way to communicate the good news. Because that's what we're called to. We preach Christ. 
And Paul would say to his letter to the point, Paul would be the next place he goes after Athens. But just a few months after that, he would send back a, a letter. And in that letter, he told everybody, he says, look, we preach Christ now. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, it's pure foolishness. He said, you know, he did all that preaching. They brought him into this place. And the reaction was not very well received. Some said, he's a wacko. And he said, well, we let him again. It's better than his rerun stuff we've been listening to every week. But a couple of people trusted in Christ. So that's not much fruit to show for it. Remember back a few years when Peter stood up and said, hey, didn't you just hang on the tree? That was Jesus, the Messiah. They all just fell on their face before God and repented and became believers. I didn't have that experience in Athens, in that class of culture. But the Bible does mention one person, Dionysius. And guess what history records for us? Dionysius was the first bishop of the Christian church in Athens. You're keeping your eyes on Christ and you're really resurrected. You make your inroads into this culture, into the people that are in our lives. You make those ways that we can connect with them in relationship to share the good news. You never have, you have no idea who you will make a difference in. Who you you'll make a difference in when you have that kind of a mindset that Paul did. But you also don't know what that life, how much of a difference it can make to our world. The first bishop in the ruins of Athens was one of these philosophers who listened to Paul make a way to communicate the good news. That's what it means to be a missionary. That's our charge. It's to go be the kind of missionary. So we're going to do this with our the communion table. We're going to join our hearts with our voices and sing together as we prepare to leave this place. This is the room, if you will, to go out to the field, to go out and be missionaries. This is a place of remembrance. Remember what Christ has done, the story that he began in your life, and the story he continues to write. What are you to do as you come to this table? Well, let me speak to you three different words. If you're in this room today, you've never called on Jesus Christ as your Savior. Honestly, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church. It doesn't matter how religious your parents are. You have to deal with the question of who Jesus Christ is. He's calling on your heart. He's speaking to you. He gives the answer to the question that your soul is afraid to voice. But this is my word for you if you've never called on the Lord. It's a simple word, but it is hard. The word is surrender. Quit fighting. Quit stopping up bricks to build a curse on the wall around you that will protect you from the truth. God loves you. And because He loves you, He sent His only Son to pay all of the price of your sin. The fact that you would choose yourself, He paid all of so, And then He rose from the dead, conquering death. And if you'll reach out and trust in Him, he says he'll reconcile you to his father. And you can begin a forever relationship with God. You can do that today, but you need to surrender. The man that the name of this Wednesday, he's with a, a, a young man who's fought his whole life to hold on to the anger of self and the unforgiveness of self. And, and, he, and nobody else is fighting for him, so he's got to fight for himself. This movie ends with his brother. He's been estranged from him. They're in the same, they're in a fight. In the UFC, cage match. And, and his brother's got him in a chokehold. He's about to go out, and, it, and his, blood, his body's broken, his spirit's broken, and his brother whispers into his ear, I love you. I love you. Tap out. It's okay. Tap out. And you see it, the crescendo of the music in the crescendo of the movie, the little brother reaches over his shoulder and claps. And it's not defeat, it's victory. He's holding on to the last bit of his broken life, a great surrender. But he's put him after him in his arms and said, I got you. I love you. Surrender. Jesus wants to do that in your life today if you've never trusted in him. Have the courage. We need to get the sin. Come find me. You can do it right where you are. But call to the Lord and just say, Lord, I surrender. I want you as my Lord and Savior. And he said, He'll reconcile and you can enter into that forever family with God. If you're in this room this morning and you've made that decision, you've called on the Lord, but it's been a long time since you've been laying bricks for the culture of God's kingdom. It's been a long time since you've been in the game. And I have a word for you too. 
choose. Choose. The scripture says you can save two masters. You either going to choose this world or you're going to choose Jesus Christ. And I say to them, Jesus, as you come to this table, you be able to pay this to get me. No, I choose you. The bricks I lay that form the very foundation of our culture will be a brick that looks and reflects the glory of your kingdom. I mean this for you, Lord. Give me the game today. And if you're here, you say, Tell me what this means to find me because I'm here because I heard last week's sermon and I'm, I'm trusting God even when He's not being seen very close and I'm leaning in and I'm strengthening my faith and I'm, I'm trying everything to see His kingdom come here as it is in heaven. But my will for you is simply this dialogue. Dialogue. With your family members, with your neighbors, with your co workers. Take up and down this valley and then we'll take the will. Find a way, make a way to enter into a relationship with them so they can hear the good news and surrender their life to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, Father God, I thank you so much for loving us. And never be in us. For helping us not just to obey as a little child, but to trust as a maturing adult. That you set aside before you in this world that seems so dark and this culture that we are afraid of and ashamed of, feel guilty of, and feel angry toward, all at the same time that it stirs us up. Lord Jesus, as we come to this table, as we surrender, as we lay our lives and our hearts before you, give us the courage to stand up and leave this place on fire for you. Stay in our spirit. To live a life for your kingdom. But Lord, let that be lived out in love and in passion and in invitation. Make a difference. Let our hearts, through our lives, in this valley and around the world, may your kingdom come as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen.